so today we're very pleased uh, to have Lee Small here from Perimeter. Um, we got his uh, PhD from Harvard, and after that, basically, seems to have worked everywhere interesting uh, in the world. Uh, he's had postdocs at IAS, the top of the Institute in Chicago, and he's also um, a professor at Yale, Syracuse, and Penn State. Uh, before finally deciding that Canada was, in fact, the best place in the world to do science and uh, becoming one of the founding members of the Perimeter Institute. Um, Lee has worked on a vast array of topics in physics, from particle theory and string theory to quantum gravity, foundation of quantum mechanics, and the problem of time, in addition to writing some uh, popular physics books, um, which you may well have read. Uh, today, he's going to talk about some of his recent work on the nature of time. Okay, well, it's great to be here again, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, this work comes out of a line of thought, which I'm not going to dwell on very much, but I can talk about some at the end, having to do, as Aaron mentioned, with the issue of the nature of time. Um, basically, and this is work with Roberto Mangiber Unger, um, Marina Cortez, and a number of other people. And the basic interest in that work is that time be fundamental. Time be not emergent, not an approximate um, means of description, but the view uh, which is in tension with or in some sense in conflict with a lot of mainstream thinking in quantum gravity and cosmology which holds that time is emergent and inessential for the description. And here is Dick. Um, of nature, we've been taking the point of view for reasons that I'm not going to start off arguing about, that time is essential for the description of nature. And this is one of about a half a dozen different directions that we're engaged in to investigate the idea that time is fundamental. And I'm going to motivate it on its own and discuss it on its own and um, only come to discuss the other ideas, the other directions towards the end. So um, I'm going to start off by talking about the arrow of time and some ideas that Roger Penrose had back in the late 70s called Penrose's Hypothesis. That is going to raise the question of whether there might be extensions or modifications of general relativity which don't have time reversal symmetry. Now, there's a wide area of study of modifications of general relativity which are motivated by dark energy, some by dark matter, some just by seeing what you can get away with playing with general relativity and adding degrees of freedom, adding symmetries, subtracting symmetries, etc. And to my knowledge, none of these are time irreversible. All of them have the symmetry under time reversal that general relativity has. So you can just take it without, I'm about to motivate it, but you can take it without motivation. It's just an interesting question. Are there modifications of gravity, modifications of general relativity, which come with an innate intrinsic arrow of time? And I'm first going to argue that effective field theory says that we could do that only at great cost. That great cost is giving up some of the gate symmetry of general relativity. So that's what we'll discuss under the title of what effective field theory has to say. Now, when you give up some of the gate symmetry of a theory, you risk two things, two heavy prices you have to pay. One of them is inconsistency, because gauge invariance is what makes field equations consistent when you have massless degrees of freedom. If you give a gauge invariance, you risk inconsistency. The other thing which comes along with it very often, when you give up gauge invariance, you get extra degrees of freedom because gauge invariance acts to say that some things that you thought were degrees of freedom, say, for example, the zero component of the photon of a vector meson, is not a degree of freedom because of gauge invariance. And if you give up the gauge invariance, you get that degree of freedom back. And so typically, the cost of giving up gauge invariance is extra degrees of freedom. But 
um, we were very interested to find one and indeed then two approaches to extending general relativity to incorporate time asymmetry which were both consistent and have no additional degrees of freedom on the local scale. And so then I'm going to talk about two extensions of general relativity that are consistent, that have consistent field equations and no additional degrees of freedom that also have a time asymmetry or an arrow of time built in. And that's the talk. Okay, now here's one path to motivation for looking at a time asymmetric extension of general relativity. The world as we observe it, as is manifest to us by every kind of observation, is highly time asymmetric. There are strong arrows of time, the thermodynamic arrow of time. The, the universe tends to increase entropy and move away from being out of equilibrium towards being in equilibrium. And the interesting question to ask there is why, even though the universe is 13 point something billion years old, it's not yet globally in equilibrium, so it still can be, have a long way to go to move towards equilibrium. Separately, the electromagnetic arrow of time, why we see things in the past and we don't see evidence of the future, why we, Maxwell's equations have retarded and advanced solutions. If there were advanced solutions were common, we could see information coming to us from the future. We don't. We only see information coming to us from the past. Why is that? Why does nature seem to pick out only part of the solutions of the Maxwell equations? And there's a similar question in gravity called the gravitational arrow of time. Um, gravitational waves may have been detected, but they're going to be interpretable presumably as giving us information from the past and not from the future. And why is that? And that's an, uh, a question that Roger Penrose asked pointedly. So these are questions there's been a lot of discussion and debate about. Um, they're mysterious because the best knowledge we have of the laws of nature, the laws of nature that are confirmed experimentally, like general relativity, quantum mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, quantum field theory, the Stern model, etc. All these theories have a symmetry of taking the future to the past and exchanging the positive direction of time for time going in the negative direction. They all have some form of time asymmetry. So that leads to the question of why the universe is so time asymmetric and has several strong and correlated arrows of time if the laws are time symmetric. And this is a big subject. I'm not going to review or even repeat much of the discussion about it, but if you look into the discussion, you discover that all the attempts to explain how time asymmetric laws manifest themselves in a time, time symmetric laws manifest themselves in a time asymmetric universe goes down to special choices of initial conditions. The initial conditions in cosmology are extremely homogeneous. You don't have any incoming gravitational waves, any incoming homogeneities. There are no white holes. There are no primordial black holes. The very early universe is seen to be very low entropy, very homogeneous. Why is that? Um, that's what the philosophers call the past hypothesis. They argue, and philosophers do spend a lot of time on this issue, that in order to explain the arrows of time, you have to make a very unlikely hypothesis about the past, which one form or another is called the past hypothesis. Um, so that's where we are. Um, and Roger Penrose pointed out and argued, and other people have argued, but Roger, I think, did very eloquently in some papers in the late 1970s. Why is that? The past hypothesis is very unlikely. If you imagine 
the initial conditions of the universe were picked randomly, as Raja used to put it, by putting a pin down in the face space, closing your eyes and putting a pin somewhere in the face space. What's the probability that you would pick a solution whose initial conditions were as special as our universe has seemed to have been? And he got numbers like one part in 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 100 and 20 something. Um, so this is a kind of explanation of the arrows of time, but it itself is very unlikely. It exchanges one improbable set of observations for an improbable hypothesis. What shows the initial conditions? So Roger's hypothesis, which he made to attempt to bring order to the situation, is the following. Maybe, ultimately, the physics that controls the initial conditions in cosmology has to do with quantum gravity, with the quantum gravity realm. It also has to do with regions near the initial singularity where the curvature was very strong. And maybe, and we all believe that we don't understand what law of nature governs the world then. That's the Planck era, that's the era near the initial singularity. And so it's some unknown quantum theory of gravity, and Penrose hypothesized that that physics, that that physical theory, would be highly time asymmetric. So that the ultimate explanation for the unlikely initial conditions that we impose on general relativity is that they're inherited from a very time asymmetric theory, which is the more fundamental theory. And so, all the solutions of the Maxwell equations of the Einstein equations, which you would expect to play a role by time symmetry, don't play a role. There are no incoming gravitational radiation. There's no incoming electromagnetic radiation. There's no incoming white holes or black holes, etc. Because all those solutions would be inconsistent with the more fundamental time asymmetric law governing the physics near the initial singularity. And that's Roger's hypothesis. And I'm not going to speculate about that theory, that time asymmetric quantum gravity theory. I just want to examine a consequence of it. If it's, because there are really two consequences of it. One of them is, if it's true, then we're very used to, in our standard approaches to statistical mechanics, understanding how time asymmetric effective laws, like the second law of thermodynamics, emerge out of time symmetric theories with special initial conditions. But Roger is hypothesizing the reverse. He's hypothesizing the time symmetric laws emerge as effective description of time asymmetric fundamental physics. And we have to ask, can that take place? Can we give examples of how time symmetric dynamics might emerge on a large scale from fundamentally time asymmetric laws. And we have something to say about that, but that's not the subject of this talk. I can say something about it at the very end of this talk if people want. We want to discuss in this talk, I'm not going to get to that slide yet, but we want to discuss an even simpler question, which is that if the fundamental laws are time asymmetric and they're emerged from them, time symmetric laws, general relativity in particular, to govern the early universe, might there be corrections to those time asymmetric laws which describe in an effective field, the proximate sense, some deviations from time symmetry which might play a role early in the universe. In other words, we ought to be able to see the deviations from time reversal symmetry in some effective theory which extends general relativity, i.e. at the level of classical, where classical general relativity is relevant. And that's what this talk today is about, is the search for whether you can have a time asymmetric extension of general relativity that might just catch the edge of this time asymmetric physics. Now, he, there are some other reasons to explore fundamental time asymmetry. This is part of the larger argument, so I should have skipped this slide. But one of them has to do with the idea that the laws evolve in nature, and that could introduce a time asymmetry. And the other one has to do with foundational issues in quantum mechanics and collapse of the wave function. And indeed, on a cosmological context, how density perturbations emerge from quantum fluctuations and inflation is part of that question. But I'm postponing these to the end. All right.
this is the question I want to emphasize. Does general relativity have a time asymmetric extension? Could it govern physics of the early universe in an effective field theory sense? And what's the cost of finding a time asymmetric extension of general relativity? What does that cost us? Well, so what do we know about this? First of all, we know at higher order, we can add terms to general relativity thinking of it as an effective field theory. And Mark Hemiankowski and collaborators, whose names I forget, and other people have explored this at higher order in the curvature. For example, we can add R wedge R terms times a scalar field to make it not topological. And we can study the effects of such terms. Such terms can break time reversal invariance and break CP, but they don't break CPT. So they don't, strictly speaking, break time reversal invariance. They break a weak form of time reversal invariance. But that's known and is in the literature. Can you do better than that? Can you break time reversal invariance at leading order at the level of two derivatives of the metric? the same order as the Einstein tensor? And the answer is no. At leading order, you can't if you assume local Lorentz invariance and space-time diffeomorphism invariance. That is the gauge invariance of general relativity. And that doesn't seem to be known, but it's elementary. Um, so why is that the case? So now I'm going to just quote a little lemma, which is not difficult to prove on a piece of paper. Um, so it's taken effective action for a theory of gravity in three plus one dimensions. I'm going to use what we call first order form where the metric and connection are independent degrees of freedom just because that lets you explore a wider range of theories. And if we want a, a, a lemma which is useful, we want to explore as wide a range of theories or not. So start with an action which is a function of frame fields and a connection which generates Lorentz transformations of those frame fields, which is a function only of those fields in their first derivatives, which is all we need to replicate general relativity. Space-time diffeomorphism invariant, invariant under local Lorentz transformations, I already said this, contains first and most terms of first order in the derivative, and you don't have to assume parity of time reversal invariance or anything else. Those are my assumptions for a gravitational theory. And that turns out to be strong enough to rule out time reversal invariance, to time reversal non-invariance. That's strong enough to rule in or make necessary time reversal symmetry. Here is the most general action compatible with these conditions. The action. Here's a sort of cute little thing that happens that specialists, people who are not specialists in quantum gravity won't know. This action, which is the most general action you can write down of the metric in the connection or the frame field in the connection that has just one derivative in each term or no derivatives, breaks parity, breaks CP, breaks time reversal invariance. But nonetheless, the field equations that come from this action our general relativity and preserve time reversal invariance. So you might think you could get away with it because, and the particular term, this epsilon E wedge E wedge the curvature term is general relativity. You have to vary the connection A and you get the condition that the torsion vanishes. But you can add this term, which is called the Holtz term. See, the, the wedge is give you something which is odd under parity and odd under time reversal. And the epsilon tensor here, which is also anti-symmetric and odd under parity and odd under time reversal, balances it. But you can add this contraction without the epsilon. And that breaks time reversal invariance and breaks parity. So you think that there's a whole range of interesting phenomenon which breaks the fundamental symmetries that comes into extending gravity just this little bit, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, and you can check this on a piece of paper because the field equations make this coefficient gamma 
unmeasurable. It, this coefficient gamma is a topological term, measures topological information, but doesn't affect the local field equations. So you almost break time reversal invariance, but you don't. Of course, that hasn't prevented there from being any number of papers in the literature about how in quantum gravity you could use that term to break time reversal invariance. But that's not what I'm interested in this talk. I'm interested in classical effects that might influence the early universe after the Planck era. So we have to break at least one of these assumptions. This is the cost. And the one that turns out to be interesting is an assumption that in most of my life... So, so with such a term, is there a, a, a low energy limit where you, know, you could say, I can do a solar system test for this? It's even, there's not even a low energy limit, it just disappears from the field equations. Because the term that says that the torsion vanishes, which comes from varying the connection, still tells you the torsion vanishes, and if there were an effect, it would have to be an effect expressed in terms of the torsion. And it's just not there. Um, so, of course, there are they come in at higher order. Uh, only in higher order. Only in higher order. This there term, are. This term, which looks legitimate, you're just saying, we don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about for early universe, but past the Planck area cosmology and for astrophysics. In quantum gravity, that term is highly important. It's called the emergency Hulse term. And that's a whole other set of talks. It's the quantum gravity theories that you get from the fact that that term is there in the most general action play a big role and make quantum gravity effects par break parity and break time reversal invariance. And if B modes had been seen at the level of 0.1 R, we would have been writing papers saying, great, you guys can measure time reversal breaking in quantum gravity using those B modes. And maybe I could talk about that after the talk. But they're just quantum gravity effects, just like the gravitational waves from inflation would have been a quantum gravity effect or is a quantum gravity effect if they're there. Okay. So as with my hat on as a quantum gravity person, I, you know, I've been known to say things about background independence, which in a technical sense means diffeomorphism and variance. So it takes a lot to get me to think about breaking diffeomorphism and variance. And my first guess was if you break diffeomorphism and variance, you lose consistency or you get lots of extra degrees of freedom, as I explained. But I'm going to tell you an adventure story about breaking diffeomorphism and variance. Two adventure stories, actually, that show that you can get away with breaking a certain amount of diffeomorphism and variance. In particular, there are two parts to diffeomorphism and variance. Now, probably most of you are not used to thinking about gravity in terms of Hamiltonian dynamics. So let me just give you the basics, because I'm going to have to use some basic facts when thinking about gravity in terms of Hamiltonian dynamics. If you think about gravity in terms of Hamiltonian dynamics, you don't think about space-time. So this is the four-dimensional space-time. You think about space evolving. So these are three spaces. We'll call them sigma. And we think about fixing data on some three geometry and that data has a three metric Q and it has a Q dot. And related to Q dot, there'll be a conjugate momentum, pi, which basically up to gauge junk and coordinate junk is Q dot, is the velocity of the three geometry. And you can write a Hamiltonian, which is a function of Q and pi, just like in classical mechanics, you write Hamiltonians, which are functions of the coordinates and the momenta. And those Hamiltonians have certain features I'll come to in a little while. But the key role is played by diffeomorphisms, and there are two kinds of diffeomorphisms. There are diffeomorphisms in the spatial slices. A diffeomorphism is a nonlinear transformation that moves the points of the manifold around. 
keeping the various causal physical relations fixed. And there are diffeomorphisms of the three slices, and we're going to call those spatial diffeomorphisms, and those are going to be untouched. Those behave a lot like the gauge transformations that you know about in electrodynamics. And then there are diffeomorphisms which change the slicing, which say that rather, in other words, these slices are the evolution of the spatial geometry in some time coordinate t. But you might use some time coordinate t prime, which differs in some arbitrary fashion. And that is called many finger time. In other words, you could evolve space forward in time with an arbitrarily different time coordinate. And the image that Johnny Wheeler used to use is that you, you can push your fingers up lots of different ways, leading to what we call refoliation, that is changing the breakdown of space time into folios of spaces evolving or many finger time. And this is what we're going to be breaking, is the many finger time gauge invariance, the freedom to describe a space time evolving in any time coordinate. So now I say that we choose to break space time diffeomorphism invariance and weaken it to spatial diffeomorphisms and global time reparameterizations. That is, there's still going to be some function of time on the manifold, and I'm going to be able to take time to some t prime, which is just a function of time. So just change the meaning of the time parameter without changing the services of simultaneity. Now, what is the cost of this breaking? Must there be extra degrees of freedom? Can this be consistent? By the way, lo local Lor Lorentz invariance is highly tested. Lorentz invariance is tested up to gamma factors now of 10 to the 12, counting the opera experiment, which some people foolishly thought meant that the neutrinos go faster than light. Interpreting that experiment correctly, it's testing special relativity up to a gamma factor of 10 to the 12. So that's extraordinary. So we have to make sure we don't interfere with the very delicate, very strong tests of special relativity as well as the tests of general relativity. Some background, some of you may have heard of hojava lipschitz gravity. hojava lipschitz gravity is based on such a breaking of space-time diffeomorphism invariance to just spatial diffeomorphism invariance. And hojava lipschitz theory does, is consistent, but does introduce extra degrees of freedom and does have an issue with experimental tests of Lorentz invariance. And we keep that in mind because we want to avoid those issues. OK. So I'm going to tell you about two ways to introduce time asymmetry into general relativity without introducing local extra degrees of freedom. And the first one is so simple, I, I would not be surprised if somebody told me that in 1942 somebody published this, because you'll see it's, it's very easy to understand. The second one is more sophisticated and subtle, and, you can understand, and I'll, I'll tell how it was discovered, and you'll see why it had to be contemporary with us. So the first one is just to take the coupling constants, the physical constants in general relativity, Newton's constant and the cosmological constant, and make them functions of this global time. Now, I've said that we have fixed a slicing of space-time as space evolving. And I'm going to pick a particular slicing in which I'm going to take the trace sorry, my handwriting is junk, but take the trace of the conjugate momentum for the metric and make it equal to a constant. And that's going to give preferred slices of the space time. And once you have those preferred slices, you have a time coordinate which is defined on the whole of the universe. And you can make constants depend on those time coordinates. So we're going to make Newton's constant and the cosmological constant depend on those time coordinates. So they're both going to be functions of time. 
This breaks the gauge symmetry, as I've said, requires a preferred foliation of space time. And this one that, that has the trace pi a constant, this is the full meaning of what it means to be a constant, is called constant mean curvature gauge condition. And people who work with general relativity numerically will know, you'll know a lot about constant mean curvature gauge condition. It's, it's very well understood. It's the most common gauge you condition. Call it uniform Hubble. Oh, yes, you can call it uniform Hubble. Exactly. So we're not doing anything radical there. Now, just a little bit about how Hamiltonian general relativity works. There's the three metric. It's momentum. They're canonically conjugate variables. The Hamiltonian is made up of constraints which generate gauge transformations. There's the Hamiltonian constraint, which has momentum square terms in it, plus potential-like terms. One of them is the cosmological constant. One of them is the Ricci scalar. And there's a constraint which generates diffeomorphisms of the spatial manifold from now on, which will just be known as diffeomorphisms, which looks like the gradient of the momentum. If you think about Gauss's law and electromagnetism, you would think del dot E because the electric field is the momentum of the, of the electromagnetism. So this is just like Gauss's law, only it has an extra index. These generate many finger time, these constraints up here, and these generate diffeomorphisms of space. And pi is like a function times the time derivative of the metric. And pi with no indices is trace. And just so I'll appear at the bracket of a quantity means it's average over space divided by the volume of space when I need that. So that's just some notation. Well, you're not even going to need most of this for version one, but just to get it on the table. So then there's the action for general relativity. L matter is the Lagrangian of matter, and that's necessarily in the story. Otherwise, there's no physics. As you'll see, there's no interesting physics. This is the Lagrangian, the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian for general relativity, the Ricci scalar, quarter dimensional Ricci scalar, the cosmological constant. Newton's con I've normalized everything by G0, which is a constant, which is the value of Newton's constant now, which is just to have a nice normalization. G is a function of time, and the cosmological constant is a function of time in the sense I've described. And I'm going to add to that action lambda g dot. So I'm making the two constants canonically, con uh, can canonically conjugate to each other. This is just like p q dot, lambda g dot, and then there's some normalization constants. Mu is the one new constant that, that I have to introduce, which we're going to talk about in a while. And g dot is just a function. It's just a function of time. So I integrate in the Lagrangian over just dt here. So that's the whole theory. And let's look at its field equations. Its field equations are Einstein's equations, where however lambda and g are functions of time now globally. And an equation for g dot. V is the volume of space, so I'm assuming that our universe is spatially finite. Mu is this constant. Minus is a minus sign, and that's the right sign, which I can come to later. And lambda dot is the average over space of the Lagrangian density times the volume of space. Those are simple equations. And that's the theory. These are first order, lambda not double dot, lambda dot, g dot not double dot. So these equations break time reversal. They break t goes to minus t. So that's all you got to do to extend general relativity to break time reversal invariance. I, I haven't said, but I'm always happy to take questions. If the, yes? Yes, but the causal structure doesn't differ. 
I claim. So the field equations are general relativity plus the fact that G and lambda are varying. And uh, you're not going to be surprised to hear me say that the variations have to be slow to agree with experiment. What I mean is that if the space time would not go like hyperbolic, the slicing would be possible. You couldn't impose a global Yes. So I'm assuming that the space time is globally hyperbolic for sure. Thank you for that. OK, um, since you're cosmologist, I'm told, I'm going to go right to cosmology. So we reduced to Friedman, Robertson, Walker. So, so then all you guys can click in, because you know Friedman, Robertson, Walker and all its forms much better than I do. The, th the three metric is the radius of the universe squared, a squared of t times some fixed metric, which is, uh, we'll, we'll just assume is a three sphere, since we said the universe is spatially finite. The conjugate momenta are pi times the inverse metric, and it's a density, so there's a square root of the determinant of q's here. And there has to be a 1 over a here, because this is a squared here, to make a and pi canonically conjugate to each other. So I'm just going to the Hamiltonian version of Freeman, Robertson, Walker. Here's what the action looks like. There's a lambda g dot. There's pi a dot. V0 is the fiducial volume of the three sphere. And there's one constraint left over, n times c, where c is the constraint that generates redefinitions re of the time coordinate. Because this is dt g dot to dt a dot, taking t to a function of t doesn't change the action, so there's a gauge invariance. And c is the constraint that generates that gauge invariance. That up to constants is pi squared over a minus a potential. This is, this is all the usual stuff. The potential is the cosmological constant term, the curvature term. I'm assuming matter. I'm not writing down radiation just not to get too confusing. And the equations of motion are pi is the Hubble parameter, which is a dot over a up to constants. Pi dot is a bunch of stuff that looks like pi squared. And all of this is exactly like the usual Friedman Robertson Walker equation. You just add to that g dot and lambda dot. And you should be asking, are those equations consistent? And I'm going to tell you they are in another couple of slides. So that's the modified cosmology. Um, to be consistent, as you guys know very well, the time derivative, you can make those equations into an a dot over a equation for the Hubble parameter squared in terms of the potential. And there's nothing new there and an a double dot equation. And the only thing that's new is that Newton's constant and the cosmological constant are functions of time and satisfy their own field equations, their own, their own equations. So what you have to check is that the time derivative of the a dot equations, the a dot squared equations, reproduce the a double dot equations. That's the standard thing you have to check. And to check that, the new time variation of the potential coming from its dependence on lambda, coming from lambda dot, and its dependence on g coming from g dot, have to vanish. And they do. And the reason why they do is that lambda and g are canonically conjugate to each other. So these are consistent modifications of Friedman, Robertson, Walker cosmology. The present limits are strong. You remember we had a parameter mu somewhere. Mu, just to parameterize it, I'm going to take out the Hubble radius squared, the present Hubble radius squared. I'm going to take out Planck's constant. So this is dimensions of action times length squared. So that's just going to make it use constants that I know. And then there's going to be some constant z. And from the present limits on g dot over g or lambda dot, Z has to be a huge number. Could I just go back to uh, trace pi equals 
constant. Sure. Um, it's not playing any role. It's going to play a role in a little while. It's well, not playing any role yet. That's the time that you're enforcing, right? Right, but the fact uh, is... I'm just saying that um, in an equilibrium galaxy, uh, that's basically zero. Right? I mean, you know, the, the, the galaxy doesn't have a Hubble expansion or contraction. So it's um, not a good time I, I have two things to say about it. First of all, that, that's, that sounds correct. Um, but let me. So, so what I'm trying to say, no. you're not going against anything you're saying. It's just that you have the potential advantage in having chosen this that the constraints on g dot, because they're in this very, relative to this rather special time slicing, maybe, um, you know, when you're in an equilibrium galaxy, you would say it's not changing, and therefore all of those uh, changes would not be relevant. Now, let me, two things. One of them is I actually haven't used that particular choice of slicing yet. So if you don't like that choice of slicing, and you like another one, for everything I've said so far, it doesn't depend on the choice of slicing. It just requires there be some choice of slicing. And because I wanted to be honest and give you some choice of slicing, I used the same one here that I'm going to be using strongly in a few slides. So I haven't used it yet, but you should come back and argue that in a few slides when I do use it strongly. So let's just wait on that. Um, and then let me come back. Um, so, so I'm almost done with this simple version. Um, you end up with a conclusion that as far as the sort of current universe is concerned, nothing, we don't get anything interesting out of this. We get a small change in g and a small change in lambda, but they're bound by experiment to be so small, it's hard to think of an observable consequence. If you go very early in the early universe, there may be some consequences. And we've worked a little bit on that, but we don't have anything to report about that. So what's interesting is that this is possible. This leads to consistent modification of the field equations of general relativity, which let lambda and g vary dynamically and break time reversal invariance. What I'm about to show you is much less trivial and much more surprising, but I wanted to show you the easy one first. But it, the easy one is not that interesting. Um, if you try to, let me just tell you two more things quickly about it. One of them is you might worry that since lambda and g are canonically conjugate, you might worry that there are quantum effects from lambda and g not commuting with each other. And you conclude that in the present universe, those are timey. So again, something that might play a role in the early universe, but we haven't found a regime or an effect of that. The other thing is just to connect it with work you, pr you probably have heard of. Um, Caliper and Padilla and a collaborator in later work considered this theory where the cosmological constant and Newton's constant become dynamical variables which you find equations for and solve for. But their version, which is this theory, the, they, lambda stands for g in, in their theory, little lambda stands for g, has just one value of g or little lambda and one value of the cosmological constant for the whole universe. So you end up saying that lambda, that lambda is the integral over the whole universe of the trace of the energy momentum tensor of matter. And their formulation is closely related to the one I've just shown you. The one I've just shown you, which has lambda g dot here rather than lambda g and an integral over time, is the differential version of theirs. If you integrate what I've just shown you over all time, you get their formulation. And I just say that in case that's something that you've heard of. Um.
There's more to say about the consistency of this theory. I demonstrated its consistency mm -hmm. in the Freeman Robertson Walker reduction, but you can look at the field equations without fixing Freeman Robertson Walker and demonstrate that the field equations are consistent. And that's a long story, which I'm not going to do in the talk. But I, can, I have some slides for it after the talk, but it basically comes down to things having to do with the algebra of the constraints that generated the gauge invariance. And that's just a preview. If you want to talk about consistency of those field equations, I got stuff ready for you. Um, and if you want to couple to matter, um, because the time derivative of lambda is related to the average energy momentum density. If you don't couple to matter, it turns out you don't get anything in this version of the theory. So this is the way you couple to matter and introduce Newton's constant as a function of time by scaling the g naught naught component of the metric differently than the others. OK, so that's the first version. I'm aware I have about 15 minutes, and I have the second version to show you. So let me jump right to that. This is a bit more sophisticated. I will probably not emphasize the details, but let me emphasize the philosophy and the results. First of all, now I'm going to really use Hamiltonian general relativity in some detail. So this is the same slide I showed before, but just to review it for people for whom it was new. The, the three metric is the coordinate that's going to get momentum is related to its time derivative. You have two constraints to generate diffeomorphisms of space and the many finger time or refoliation. Now I'm going to be more specific about the gauge fixing or the coordinate condition. And this is what I mean by constant mean curvature. I mean the trace of pi is related to the average value of pi over space. So I'm going to be imposing this as the condition for constant mean curvature. And Dick's objection or issue, maybe we'll come back and talk about it at the end, because I'm going to use this strongly. Now the interesting thing is that this object by itself is interesting. It's not just a gauge fixing condition. It generates an interesting set of transformations on the degrees of freedom of general relativity and matter, which is local changes of scale. See, trace pi has in it a PQ in it, and PQ scales P one way and Q the other way. So this object, just the pi part, generates what are called local scale transformations of the metric and also of the metric as it comes into the coupling of matter. This bit, which says that pi is not 0 but is equal to a constant because the, the bracket of pi is its average over space, this is just to make the density, the thing into a density properly. This tells us that you get local scale transformations that preserve one number, which is the volume of space. So you can make any local changes of scale as long as the total volume of space is preserved. And this is our gauge fixing condition. Uh, can I say this another way? So uh, the mean pi is a volume average, but you haven't said anything about the structure of the space and whether it's finite or infinite. I'm assuming it's finite. Well, I'm just wondering whether one can't make that condition that if I consider pi as smooth over some scale r, then it's d pi, pi dr equals zero is the analogous condition. So that, in effect, what's happening is that if I change the smoothing scale, I'm forcing that that doesn't change. Is, is that another way of stating the same thing? I think so, but I... So that's a, a, a fairly strong condition, obviously. I'm not sure. Let, let, let me get as how far I'm going to get in the details, and then let's come back and discuss. So there's a 
version of general relativity which has been studied the last five years called shape dynamics. And I need to tell you what it is, and then I'm going to modify it. And that's going to take me all the time that I have to do those two things. That's why I'm pushing the discussion back. Shape dynamics is a version of general relativity that relies on an interesting trick of the mind. General relativity, I've told you, we're going to assume the spatial diffeomorphisms, the diffeomorphisms of space are a gauge invariance. Here's the Hamiltonian constraint of general relativity. And I just told you that we're going to gauge fix it with this gauge fixing, which gives us constant mean curvature. But I've just told you that this gauge fixing by itself generates an interesting class of transformations, which are local scale transformations. So you can flip their designation. And you can say, I'm interested in a gravitational theory with local scale invariance. And then I consider this the gauge symmetry of the theory, local scale transformations. And I'm going to forget about this for a moment. Then I get a, a, a version of a gravitational theory that has local scale invariance and spatial diffeomorphisms on a fixed set of slices. Then I have to gauge fix that gauge invariance of local gauge trans of local scale transformations. So I'm going to invent this ugly thing to gauge fix this beautiful thing. And it turns out you can write general relativity consistently with the reversal or reversing what's gauge fixing and what's a constraint. What does that get you? It gets you a lot. One of the things it gets you is ADS CFT in a beautiful formulation because it makes the scale invariance of the conformal field theory manifest. It, it gets you a lot of stuff which I don't have time to tell you about. It's called shape dynamics and it's been investigated the last five years or so. And you can think of, well, let, let me not burden you with other ways to think about it. Just take, take the assertion that that's interesting. It's locally equivalent to general relativity, but it has a preferred time slicing. Now we're going to use that preferred time slicing to investigate modifying general relativity in a way that I couldn't have said without knowing about shape dynamics. And I think I'm going to skip this blah, blah, blah and get right to the point. Enrique Gomez, who is a collaborator in this work and one of the inventors of shape dynamics, asked the following questions. He said, look, here's the, ignore the red circle for a moment. Here's the Hamiltonian constraint of general relativity. Here's the generator of local scale transformations which preserve the volume of the universe. The, each of them, together with the diffeomorphisms of space, makes a consistent theory which can be gauge fixed by the other one. They give you a kind of pair of equivalent formulations of a theory in which you trade one kind of gauge invariance, many finger time, for another kind of gauge invariance, local scale invariance. And again, the fact that you can trade those consistently is at the heart of ADS CFT. Um, what, how often can you do this? Are there other pairs of theories that have this way of fitting together? And he asked the question, can I extend this pairing of gauge invariances to other theories? And what can I do? And he investigated that in this paper in 2013. And he found he could take a term linear in trace pi and just add it. And it has a coefficient which is 1 over length. And he published that. And we were talking, and I said, well, gee, that breaks time reversal invariance. Indeed, if you think of pi like some moment or velocity, that's like introducing friction into a system. It's like introducing something linear in the momentum into the energy function. So it introduces a kind of friction, and that breaks time reversal invariance. So we worked on that for a while, and then and it's interesting, and I'll show you a little bit what you can do with it. Then we said, can you get more general? And we said, what if we multiply this friction term 
by some function of the degrees of freedom. And we tried lots of different stuff. And the thing that we found is you can multiply it by a function of the volume of space, which is a degree of freedom because space is compact and closed. And so, and remarkably, you can make any function of the volume of space and put it here, and it doesn't affect the consistency of the dynamical degrees of freedom, or the evolution of the degrees of freedom. And the sketch of the proof is here. Now, in a Hamiltonian point of view, the consistency of the degrees of freedom has to do with the algebra under Poisson brackets of the constraints. And if you know a lot about that, you would understand what I'm pointing to in this equation. Otherwise, just take my word for it that what this is showing is that for any function of volume here, you don't change the algebra of the constraints. So you don't change the consistency of the theory. You don't change the counting of the degrees of freedom. For any function of volume here, you have a consistent extension of general relativity, which breaks time reversal invariance. And that's the big claim that we're making here. There's the first version of it was sort of obvious, change lambda, change g, make them functions of time. You get a little bit. But what you get is highly constrained experimentally. Here there's a class of modified gravity theories to explore, all of which break time reversal invariance, and all of which have two massless spin two degrees of freedom and look locally like general relativity. Um, so might they play a role in cosmology? And I'm almost out of time. I'll show you the basics, but I won't show you everything. Sure. C, uh, this is probably trivial, but I mean, maybe worked it out. So um, suppose that I take a particle mm. Q and P, and I put in a Q dot the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. that must be a very special multiplier in order for it to actually appear at Hamiltonian as opposed to, you know, a dissipative uh, term. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what is basically going on here? Mm -hmm. You've got it in Hamiltonian. If you had a theory, if you have a version of Hamiltonian mechanics, which is invariant under reparametrizing the time, and you can write Newtonian mechanics that way, they're called Barbara Bertotti models, and there are models for thinking about gauge invariances which involve redefining time. If you go to those models and you stick in terms like this, you get theories that, mo that, mo that break time reversal invariance in interesting ways for a system of interacting particles. And this is being studied for n-body for n-body systems under gravitational interaction. There's a little literature about doing this for n-body systems. So there is, a, there is stuff to do there. OK. Let me just talk about the basics of Freeman, Robertson, Walker. I won't, say, I won't impose on you all the details of all the models, because I thought I would have a little bit more time. But I'll give you the basics, and then I'll stop. Again, we go to Freeman, Robertson, Walker the same way we do before, introducing the radius of the universe and its conjugate momentum. This is just like we did before. The action is pi a dot minus a Lagrange multiplier times the constraint. The constraint is pi squared. Here's the friction term. I change. I call it now g of a rather than f of a because there's a little bit of rescaling involved. Here's the original v potential as a function of a, which is the standard thing from Freeman, Robertson, Walker cosmology. So all I'm doing is adding to Freeman, Robertson, Walker cosmology this class of theories. Um, this is the standard way of finding the field equation, the equation of motion. So I'm going to go right to these. So this is the Hubble squared term and the acceleration term. You have this new function g of a with here and here. And other than that, everything is the same as what you're used to. 
There's a new equation of state. There's a new contribution to the energy density and a new contribution to the pressure. So you have an equation of state, which you can work out. And you guys are very good at looking at this and playing with this much better. So what exactly was little g? Little g isn't related to the metric, or is it? It's not. It's a function of the volume. If, if you start off with a function f of the volume, arbitrary it's an arbitrary function of the volume. And so the correction with the scaling you've got uh, has an extra g in it, so it's tiny uh, for most instances. Is that correct? Well, you, you may very well want to take g going like a o with to some negative exponent p so that it will become important early in the universe and not important later. Yeah, so you can do in your head in five minutes what took us a week um, just working out. So let me just show you two instances and the key, the key point. Here's what a time asymmetric version of dark energy looks like. This dark energy is a constant. This is a constant. G is Newton's constant. So in the case that G is linear in A, you get a correction to dark energy. And there's only, and the freeman robertson walker dynamics look the same. Let me tell you, there's a bunch of equations, but let me tell you the, the bottom line. The bottom line is that if you look at the evolution of the radius of the universe, you don't see the time asymmetry. But if you look in the space-time connection, you do see the time asymmetry particularly in the space-time connection as it couples to neutrinos. So you learn that neutrinos are going to be very sensitive to the time asymmetry that is introduced in this way. And that's the basic bottom line. Let me just point to that, and then I'll close. So the, the, in this example, there's an expanding universe. A goes like the exponential of t. There's a contracting universe. A goes like the exponential of minus t. But the conjugate momentum are not time reversals of each other. And why that's important is that the coupling to neutrinos and other chiral fermions involves a connection A called the Ashtakar connection, which involves the conjugate momentum linearly. And because of that, neutrinos and other chiral fermions can feel the difference between being in an Einstein universe and being in a universe like this, which is an asymmetric extension of Einstein. And that's the basic conclusion we came to. So let me, let me go to a bunch of conclusions. So we found out that the time irreversible extensions of general relativity exist without introducing extra degrees of freedom. All these theories have two massless spin two degrees of freedom, plus the global degrees of freedom like the volume of space. We investigated two of them, two ways of doing that, two classes, one by adding friction to shape dynamics. And I didn't tell you about the dark radiation example, but I told you briefly about the dark energy example. The time asymmetry is detectable in how neutrinos propagate. And the other one involving the constants of the theory becoming functions of time. So the conclusion is, this is very tentative, that Penrose's hypothesis can be investigated if you're going to realize it at the level of effective field theory, you're going to have to break this, the local many finger time and introduce some preferred notion of slicing into your gravitational theory. This we should hesitate to do because it brings extra degrees of freedom, brings inconsistencies, and brings violations of Lorentz invariance when it's usually studied. But remarkably, thinking carefully about the structure of the field equations, we found two ways to do this. And we suggest that they could be investigated for their consequences for early universe phenomena. So thank you.
g a function of time. Um, and don't make lambda a function of time. So you can do that by making g a function of time and space, and then it's a brans dickey theory. And then you get, we all, we all those of us who have studied brans dickey theory know that the conservation of the energy and momentum tensor has extra terms in it to take into account, the g dot and so forth. Um, but it's not very pretty. It's, it's possible it's not very pretty. What's pretty about that version and why the field equations maintain consistency is that it always comes down to the fact that G, I showed it in the Freeman Robertson Walker case, but it happens more generally. It always comes down to the case that when G and lambda are canonically conjugate, you get possible inconsistencies which cancel in pairs in the field equations. I would say exactly the opposite. Uh, Good. JBD theory is elegant and simple, but it is, in fact, a full-up, uh, self-consistent, time-reversible uh, theory. I think, and so again, you'll correct me for errors in thinking, but I have always thought lambda's conjugate is the four volume, which it is. And then what has been done here is that you are because of the special time, you're adding another sort of effective conjugation, but it's very effective, and you're uh, storing it in G, but it could be stored in the asymmetry of the uh, strain in time as opposed to strains in space, because the conjugate for lambda is really the, uh, effectively the, the total space time strain, mm -hmm. a trace of it. And so, anyway, I'm just saying that there is this breaking going on, which you're saying is very elegant, but it is being broken, and it's very different from the concept of the theory. Yeah, it's very different from Brand's Dickey theory. And the breaking of space-time, of many-finger time, um, I have a very schizophrenic feeling about that. Uh, this is part of the stuff that I skip, but just to go back to it. Um, there is this larger research program I talked about, about looking for ways to make time fundamental. And from various directions comes the necessity of thinking about global time as physical. If you want laws of nature to evolve in some sense, you need a global time. If you want to understand the measurement problem in quantum mechanics in terms of some completion of quantum mechanics, like Bohr's theory, Bohm, sorry, Bohm de Broglie theory, you need a global time. If you want a spontaneous collapse theory to understand quantum mechanics, you need a global time. So I find myself being sort of pinned to the wall, needing a global time. And the part of my personality, my scientific personality that's been doing quantum gravity my whole career, Rebels, what do you mean a global time? The whole beauty of general relativity and gravity is the many, the many finger time. And I was really caught with that contradiction until shape dynamics was invented or was discovered. And shape dynamics is the key to having both. Shape dynamics was invented about five years ago, partly by Julian Barber and the collaborator and partly by Tim Kozlowski, Sean Gribb, and Enrique Gomez at Perimeter, um, three young kids at Perimeter. And once you have shape dynamics, you understand that you don't have to just get rid of many finger time. You can trade it for local scale invariance. That is, you, can, you don't lose a gauge invariance. You just redefine the action of a gauge invariance from giving you the effect of changing the time coordinate to giving you the effect of changing the local scale. And you can have general relativity, a theory which is locally, it's probably not globally, and I can explain what that means if you go on, it's probably not globally equivalent to general relativity, but it's locally equivalent to general relativity. Locally, that is both in space time and in the space of solutions. And so you can have your cake and eat it too, so to speak, let alone you, you get a deeper insight into ADS CFT. So that liberated our thinking to think seriously about the possibility that there's a global time in physics. And this project is a consequence of that. <laughs>